Hi, I'm Bill Corcoran Jr. This is the On The Stacks Podcast. Oh yeah, whoa, look, they can never keep me down, I'm going, and if I ever fail to snow, I'll go again. I never quit, because I know that every loss may lead to another win, I'm going up. I think business is great in many respects, like for people going into it, because you gain wisdom. You're forced to do things that are extremely uncomfortable, have extremely uncomfortable conversations, you know, put yourself in uh, positions you normally wouldn't and have to solve problems that you would never put yourself in the position of solving if you didn't have to. Um, And through those experiences comes things like wisdom, which then allows you to be in a more comfortable position to do those things again in the future. Today, I'm chatting with Jordan Galasso, owner of Fit AF. This episode is brought to you by Burn, the fitness company behind the Today Show approved Burn Board. If I'm being honest, working out can be a real chore, especially as a new dad in desperate need of sleep and cardio. Burn is founded by NEPA native Jimmy T. Martin, and his Burn Board offers a low impact core and cardio experience unlike anything I've done before. They have hundreds of on-demand workouts that are great for beginners, seasoned athletes, and out-of-shape podcast hosts who love supporting small businesses. My wife and I use it pretty frequently throughout the week, and it's honestly a great way to burn a ton of calories without burning a ton of cash. Not to mention, it's a great tool for skiers, runners, wrestlers, and hockey players. Jimmy is offering all On The Stacks listeners 15% off when they use the code STACKS15. Visit theburn.com today to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15 at checkout. Again, that's theburn, T-H-E-B-R-R-N.com to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15. It's time to get on board today with Burn. This episode is brought to you by Blue Door Financial. Blue Door Financial will help you save money and reduce taxes to live a fuller financial life. To learn more, visit Blue Door Financial online at bludoorfinancial.com. That's bludoorfinancial.com. What's up, podcast episode 114 of the On The Stacks podcast here in the Blue Door studio. Welcome to the show, Jordan. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Fit AF. Yes. What does that stand for? Oh, God, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> You're allowed to say it. Yeah, it is fit as fuck. Uh, that was the plan initially. I had uh, my chiropractor... Five years ago, when I was thinking about starting the business, I was like, yeah, you should think of something like controversial to name it. <laughs> controversial? Uh, yeah. I like, this, I, I like this chiropractor already. He was, he was a man. Um, and initially, I was like, huh, fuck yeah, foods. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I almost went with it. I almost filled out the paperwork. And then somebody was like, no, that's way too like. It's a little aggressive. That's, that's too much. You have to dial it back a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then fit I, I forget I, I have two friends that both claim they came up with it um i don't i forget which i don't know we had a few conversations they were like yeah fuck yeah foods we can't do that but you know and we kind of went back and forth and then out of that spurred yeah, we got the subliminal yes that's what they call it so yeah fit as fuck yes but if you're not prepared for that then it's fit and fresh Fam- fit as a yeah. fiddle fit as a fiddle yeah yeah family friendly in case it's a family friendly yes event Definitely fit and fresh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So you're not, you're not, an, you're not from any PA. Mm-hmm. You are a transplant here. Yeah. So where are you from and what brought you here? Oh God. That's, that's a big one, right? Yeah. Um, big, the big question. Yeah. So I'm from Connecticut. I'm from a town called Cheshire, which is slightly North of New Haven. Um, I spent, well, I was there until I was about 20 and then moved out here. I'm about to turn 30. So I've been here for 10 years. Uh, I moved here because uh, I was getting in trouble. I was a naughty kid. Troublemaker. Um, and truthfully for me, it was, you know, uh, using drugs and partying and things like that, which, you know, I thought was the point of life at the time to like have as much fun as possible and to like really just ring the bell of like pleasure as much as possible. So what, like as a teenager? Yeah, pretty much from 12. So I started, you know, experimenting uh, with things at 12 uh, and then up till 20 that I finally stopped when I moved out here. Uh, yeah, but it, it was weird, too, because I, you know, I as much as I did that a lot and different, you know, when I was 16, you know, I started getting really heavy into certain things. But I still like people ask me about the fitness stuff and I got into fitness when I was 12. Um, so simultaneously, as I was working out and like, 
you know, eating certain things and doing all this research to figure out what was best. And like, really, I, I love the fitness aspect of everything. Um, I was also just taking a bunch of drugs. Uh, and they both, <laughs> yeah. you know, clashed a little bit as, as you <laughs> yeah. would assume. Yeah, but de- I, I, definitely a little clashing there. Oh, yeah. I always had this, I think, like this thought that uh, they would like um, balance each other balance, out. Yeah. That like maybe I wouldn't die because my heart was in really good shape. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so um, yeah, I mean, childhood grew up, I mean, great family. Everyone treated me well, but uh, for some reason chose that path um, and then decided it was not something that could continue uh, without consequence, you know, whether I went to jail for a while or killed myself, whatever it might be. Uh, so I went to why well, moved out here. Basically I just got treatment and then ended up staying here, uh, made friends and then kind of planted my roots here. So d- did you, you said you did uh, treatment. Was it here in any PA? Yeah, I did. No. So Reading, okay. Reading was a treatment center. I went there and then there's a place in Hamlin I went to, uh, basically. So Reading was, you know, your 30 day treatment. And then at the end of that 30 days, they go up to you and you're like, all right, are you ready? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no. So then they send you to what they call a uh, post care, um, which was another, another additional three months. I actually went to a, uh, if anyone knows John Mullaney, I just saw him recently. He just went to the same rehab I went to. Uh, fun fact, fun fact. So, uh, so, so, so like what, what, what was it? You said it was drugs. Yeah. Um, primarily heroin uh and then methamphetamine toward the end hmm. so yes. like what, what like like were you were you doing other uh, something else other drugs before the heroin that led to heroin yes so, and that's a good point so most people don't jump right up to heroin i was gonna say yeah you um, don't just uh that's like yeah that's like level 10 yes so you you go up the level so you start with you know usually weed and marijuana and then you're like oh this is cool but maybe there's something better and then you you know you might go to the hallucinogens or like the prescriptive narcotics and stuff like that. Um, And then once you, you know, get tired of tripping in the woods and eating a bunch of Xanax, then you find heroin, methamphetamine. Uh, Some people, it's booze. But usually a lot of people land there. um, And then that's the end of the journey because they either die or uh, they get arrested and uh, go to jail for a long time or they get treatment and you know, stop. So what, what was it for you? Like, what was, what was the moment in your life that you're like, I'm going to maybe get some help here. So it's funny cause I kind of alluded to it before, but it actually didn't happen until I was in treatment. So my parents, basically I was living with my parents at the time and they were like, yeah, either get out of the house and this, you know, I was constantly not living at home and then I would come back and then they kicked me out again, but they were finally like, dude, you know, we've had enough. Get uh, your shit together. Yeah. And I, my initial plan was to stay with friends. I was like, all right, screw you guys. (laughs) I'm going to go stay with my friends. And then my friends didn't want me there. And that's when I was like, huh, fuck you guys. (laughs) But, but then a couple weeks later, so whatever, I ended up going to treatment and then I was like, huh, maybe this lifestyle isn't, uh, maintainable. Maybe it's not ideal. Maybe there's something better. And that like thought almost propelled me forward. that thought of like, a lot of people don't use drugs and they seem happy. So maybe there's something to that. I don't get it, but maybe there's something <laughs> yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what was it? How, how long have you been sober? <sighs> so, so I moved out here pretty much when I moved out here, I was 21. So about nine years. So, but it looks like this. So I spent the first six years completely sober. And then we can go into this or not, but I, the past three years, I introduced, uh, psychedelics, um, for various reasons. Um, and that's not something that I recommend to people who are sober by any means, but for me, it has helped in numerous ways. And initially it was microdosing. Um, I went to Indonesia and ended up doing a plant ceremony there, uh, which I mean, a plant, like it what sounds, is that? What, what does that mean? It's a it's a highbrow way of saying you went into the woods with somebody you didn't know and took drugs, uh, but but it's actually not. I mean, I say that tongue in cheek. Um, so basically, you usually consume a substance. So ayahuasca is like the normal one. We ended up doing, um, and it was just by struck. I didn't actually go into Indonesia for this. It was a business conference. 
um, just met a bunch of cool people there and ended up happening. But we consumed uh, DMT in an edible form uh, and psilocybin. So it was basically a chocolate with both of those compounds. And you basically go through these rituals. There was a shaman there. This girl, Comet, she was absolutely gorgeous. She had all white on. Uh, she looked like like literally just what an angel, like what an angel would look like in person. So uh, did she actually look like this like before you were sober? Or so was yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. I need a little clarification here. Uh, yes. Okay. So before okay. all of the okay. things were consumed, yes. Okay. All right. Um, Good to know. It was a very interesting experience. So basically, yeah, you consume it. You go through a few different rituals. Um, you kind of go off. So we were in like basically the rainforest fucking phenomenal i mean but so i was bali indonesia which is just a beautiful place um and then we all come together at the end and kind of like uh basically talk about the experience stuff like that so the whole idea is that you're reintegrating whatever happened uh in a way so to make it productive so it's not just like oh let's go take drugs it's like okay let's expand um the the site in which the sight of things we normally see within ourselves um, and then, you know, discuss later. Anyways, that sounds like, I don't like how I worded that, but. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so what is micro dosing though? You mentioned micro dosing okay. and I'm not really familiar. Yeah. When, I, when I told a couple people that <clears throat> you were coming on and I was, I was, I mentioned a little bit of this to, to a couple of our people and they're like, oh yeah. And they, yeah. So I know yeah. a little bit, um, but I want to know. Sure. I wanna know and you. let me, you know, I, I have to state, so we went. The first part of this podcast, we went right into the drug stuff, and <laughs> yeah. I, there's a lot more to me than yeah. this. Yes, <laughs> so, which we're going to get to. Yeah. Um, microdosing is taking a small, imperceptible amount of uh, really anything, but generally a psychedelic such as LSD or psilocybin mushrooms. Um, and the aim is a couple of different things. So I might, so LSD. You might take, so a microdose is like five nanograms. So a hit of LSD is about 100 nanograms, just one hit. And if you really wanted to like, you know, see things that you can't see normally, you would take five hits. So a microdose is maybe a 40th. I do about 2.5 nanograms, which is a 40th of a tab. Very, very small amount. Um, And I found it fantastic for, so I'm like kind of ADHD almost. Like it's hard for me to focus. It's allowed me to focus because, uh, organize, plan better, and really just become very creative with what I do. Um, uh, you also like it, it helps facilitate facilitate things like flow states, which are just incredible. And we could talk about that basically where you just like lose track of time. And that's, so you lose track of time. You're, you know, the sense of time kind of dilates and you're so focused on what you're doing. Flow states are big in like, uh, action sports, you know, people, Action sports have come a long way because they're such a strong facilitator of flow because when you're going down a mountain on skis uh, and you're going at however fast I go, 20, 30 miles an hour, like you need to be so focused on what you're doing or else you'll die. So being that present facilitates an experience of flow, which is, you know, most people could recognize when they might have experienced this. Sometimes you get into a flow state when you're at work uh, you just get into a groove where you're like killing it um getting a bunch of stuff done uh athletes experience flow anyways so it is very conducive for that um so for you like what what do you do is there is there a specific um activity you know in your life that you do that it helps you yeah do it so for me it's guitar and a principle of flow is that flow begets more flow. So if you get flow in some area, it'll help expand your ability to, to get it and say work. So for me, like working on the business, like it's not always, you know, a lot of it's like, you know, accounting and like handling staff and stuff like that. Like that stuff doesn't create flow um, naturally, but you can get into a rhythm where you're going throughout your day and you know, those tasks come up and there's still a lightness to them. So, um, anyways, guitar is a big one for me. Um, exercise, running, uh, and sometimes I skateboard, snowboard at times, but anything, um, like that. And I, whenever somebody asks me like, Oh, so how do I, you know, how do I get enough flow? And you know, what activities should I do? And usually it's what are the things you enjoyed as a kid or a teenager that you no longer do anymore? And, 
that stuff is huge from just like an overall um, uh, life uh, optimal, you know, being at a certain amount of contentment. There's, and I took a course on, like it was a neuroscience course about a year ago on flow. It was very informative, but you need a certain amount of flow. I actually don't want to say need, but without a, you know, a few minutes of flow on a daily or weekly basis, like you'll be miserable. Um, truthfully, a lot of people don't, aren't able to access that. And you can't access it on command. That's the other thing too. <laughs> that, that, um, was, that was my next question. How does one access the flow? Um, you can't. So the more you try to, the more you'll push it away. If you're going backwards. Right. It because So it's got to happen. I mean, it's you lose yourself. So what happens is, so when you're in flow, there's certain statistics. You're 500% more productive. You're, I forget all the other stuff, but a lot of times people think, wow, your brain must, you know, you must be utilizing so much of your brain. Um, and it's actually the opposite. You, uh, activity in the prefrontal cortex, the forebrain, um, which is a mammalian thing and quite honestly where a lot of our thinking and like overthinking comes from, all that chatter goes down and you're left with subconscious processing. So it's basically a lack of interference from the forebrain, which is a very common theme in other areas of uh, things that cause issues or cause people, you know, uh, levels of unhappiness or whatever. Like that forebrain is great in many respects. It's great for planning. It's kind of like the adult of the brain. Um, But it also gets in the way a lot. Um, So anyways, and the goal is not to like, I mean, we could say, you know, when you're in flow, you're losing yourself. Yes. But again, you can't just do that. You can't say, all right, you know, I'm going to not think about things and get into flow. Like that doesn't, that doesn't work. You have to massage it. And then, uh, it just kind of happens when it happens. You probably experience it when you're talking to people. Yeah. Um, especially on the podcast. Kind of just get in a zone. I'm going to call it yeah. getting in the zone, but yes. I guess you would call it flow. Yes. This is like a real scientific thing. It is. Right? Uh, yes. This guy, me, oh God, his name is crazy. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi uh, was the first guy to establish it and gave flow its name. He actually just died a few months ago. Um, but there's a guy, uh, Stephen Kotler. So he's the one who I read a lot of his stuff where he talks about it. Stephen Kotler uh, runs the Flow Research Institute, basically. Um, they just spend a lot of time and money on researching flow um, for reasons of like performance mainly. So sport performance, athletic performance, because when you're in these flow states, your output goes up, uh, your ability to perform goes up um, and your ability to take in and learn information also goes up. It's really like, so neurochemically it's a lot of dopamine, uh, which is a good thing. Um, Well, I mean, and we could even go into that, but, uh, and just to clarify, so when you Ted, when you, when you mentioned like the, uh, the dosage, the, the amount, the dosage of LSD that you took, right. like just for, for people that be like, Oh my God, what, what's this guy doing? Like right. it, it, it is, and you I'll let you speak on it, but it's a very, very small, hence the name micro dose. Yes. So you're not like tripping out over there crawling on the floor. No. Uh, right. Yeah. And you don't need <laughs> that to get in a flow. It, I mean, to a degree, it helps um, mainly because it helps bring about a sense of presence. So you can't get in flow when you're thinking of, you know, other things like it's literally just an intense sense of being present, which I even hate to say that because people hear that and they're like, oh, God, that's like that's like too woo woo. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's what it is. OK. And what about like in business? Like what like what? has it how has it helped you like is there something in business too that kind of helped you um referring to the microdosing yeah yeah so it's helpful for blind spots among other things so quite often it's easy to as humans not see where we're i don't want to say wrong but uh we can't always smell our own shit if i had to put it yeah. eloquently <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so and a lot of times, not being able to see that has consequences. Um, whether it's that you you know you make the wrong decision or whatever it is, so it gives you another point. It helps you observe your behaviors from another point of view. And so to go on this further, so taking these substances does not fix you. It does not 
just like cure you or make you be able to do this stuff. You have to have a strong intention of like, this is what I want to do. Like some, like you have to have a goal you have to like something yes. you want to achieve. So even if I do, so if I do a microdosing regimen, it is like that. It's not just like, oh, today feels like a good day to do it. No, it is very planned out. It's okay for the next month on every third day, I'm going to dose, you know, 2.5 nanograms and I'm going to, here's our, these are my metrics that I'm going to log. And at the end of this month, this is the goal of what I want to get out of it. And a lot of times it is things like, okay, I have this issue or this problem that I'm dealing with and I can't figure out a way around it. And I'm going to make that, you know, my sole focus for today. Um, and sometimes I'll sit with it and sometimes, you know, it'll just kind of sit in the background. Um, and there's a few, like a couple of cool things you could do if you want to like, cause the more we get, the less we get stuck, the further we'll propel forward. Getting stuck, you know, you can get stuck on anything, but a lot of times it has to do with your can perceived notions of how things should be or your attachments to things. Um, and these things all cause us to get stuck. So um, that, you know, what I just alluded to helps, but there's also things like all, you know, I might journal or jog something down in a notebook before I go to bed and kind of just let the you know subconscious mind or whatever think about it and then wake up journal it again and i've done that a few times and have gotten like great epiphanies from uh just planting that seed at night and then waking up the next day and like that saved me a lot of time that i would have been like you know running in circles not being able to figure things out yeah yeah can you give me an example like you said you had an epiphany (laughs) like what was what was like something that you say like was a was an epiphany oh god um uh, let me try to think of one and not like kind of allude to one. I mean, I, I, I can't think of anything concrete, but I feel like I could give, uh, a vague answer. Um, I often get stuck with, uh, I guess we could call it attachment. So attachments and here, I actually don't like that word either. <laughs> um, but that's the thing. So when in business uh, or doing anything. So obviously you want what you're doing to be successful, or I shouldn't say obviously, but obviously I want fit AF to do well. I am very close to it, very close to it. And I want it to do well. That's okay. But if I'm overly focused on the outcome of fit AF doing well, and I have depending on what the, the intrinsic or extrinsic motivation on is for me wanting fit AF to do well, it's going to create a ton of anxiety. So initially when I started the business, there was, you know, I was naive and it was, you know, it was like, Oh, let's start a business and maybe, you know, we'll do well and make money. And then, you know, it'll be cool. And people will be like, wow, good job. And all that stuff. And a lot of that stuff is like subconscious too. It's like, you know, we desire things like uh, recognition and praise. Um, We might not think we're making taking actions based on that but um oftentimes we are anyways that and that's fine like you know get into business to make money sure the issue becomes extrinsic motivation extrinsic motivators like that often cause an uneasiness because you're afraid of not getting it so Initially, when I started the business, I was always frantic and I was full of anxiety and it wasn't enjoyable at all. Um, And that was a blind spot for me because it was kind of like, so why am I doing this? And if you asked me that, I would have been like, well, I really like I do like working with people and I like getting people healthier. And, um, you know, I love cooking and I love putting together food that tastes good and um, is healthy for them. And then, but underlying that was like, yeah, but like I was bullied in high school and I'm just trying to prove myself. You know what I mean? So that was the louder voice, even though it was very unconscious. And that was why I was so frantic. The process of growing the business was a, was a, uh, it, it put me in the position to either get what I thought I wanted or not. And when I thought that I was, going to lose that thing that I wanted, I would freak out. And when I thought that I was moving toward it, I would feel better. So I kind of went down another rabbit hole. But the point of that was those are blind spots that cause a lot of damage in people's lives, meaning people chase their entire lives. 
like I'm glad that I somewhat have realized this at an early point because how many people are doing things, are efforting on a daily basis to get something that they think they want, which in reality is not going to satiate them to the degree that they think they will. And they will forever do that, striving to attain things. Sometimes they'll attain it, sometimes they won't. And then it'll be, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And then they'll die. And that is a very sad existence that scares the crap out of me uh, to constantly be in that um, hamster wheel of like attainment. Uh, and I think I really, so like drugs impacted me in a way that uh, helped me realize there is no uh, sustained pleasure, right? So when you're doing drugs, <laughs> when you're ingesting substances, <laughs> yeah. let's make it a little more uh, not as bad, but there's, you know, you're doing it because you want to uh, distract yourself from things you don't want to deal with. That's the primary reason people ingest substances. Yes, it feels good, but it feels good. And you're not thinking about all the things that make you anxious and depressed and stuff like that to a degree. Um, <sighs> that is actually, in my opinion, drugs alone, why a lot of people do a lot of things. A lot of, a lot of what we do is in reaction to the fact that we are oftentimes unhappy um, and we really just seek pleasure and to be moved away from pain and we're not quite sure what's gonna do it, so we try a, a bunch of different things. I forgot the original question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were, you were talking about um, you know how it's just you know these distractions and and kind of how you found like what really makes you happy you were talking about your business yes. and you know how you thought you really loved helping people and you thought like you really loved right, that right, right. does that so you? yeah so if we go back to like when i started the business and i was miserable the whole time it was because i was solely focused on extrinsic motivation and i'll parallel this to weight loss because i work with a lot of people trying to get them to lose weight and one of the first things i have them do is answer to me, why do you want to lose weight? And usually they give me a few answers of, oh, I want to look good for summer or, oh, I want to, you know, fit in my wedding dress. All that's good and that's fine. But you need a strong intrinsic drive, a strong why, because uh, that's what carries you through. And oftentimes it's not obvious. So for me with the business, it's something I still work on. So um, I, I am infatuated with the idea of just... Uh, call it mastery. So putting a full, my full effort into something for no other reason than it makes me feel really good to apply myself to something. Um, and that to me has been uh, a quality within myself that I've been trying to grow because it's not like it, it, it comes with no attachment in a sense, right? There's no like, well, I want to, you know, gain mastery because, well, then people will be like, oh, sick, he's a master or w whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, because all of any of that comes with the downside of being afraid of not getting that. And to me, the purpose of, you know, the business, the purpose of anything I do is um, to not, to not create any more, uh, angst or to, to not, uh, to not create any more problems than, uh, life already throws at you. And I don't want to call them problems, but, um, we can't control what happens to us. We could just control our reaction to them. So as long as I'm doing my thing, um, as long as I don't really care too much about what happens, uh, which is kind of my shtick of like, yes, I want Fideyev to do well. I want all my relationships to be well. But in the same sense, like, I know that nothing's permanent. And if the business fails tomorrow, I will become very upset. Don't get me wrong. Very upset. Um, but I also know that that's life. Uh, and not to turn this into like a whole like motivation <laughs> talk shtick. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But it's very true. And that just kind of is how I am or how I think about things, I guess. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's 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 talk about Fit AF now. So, okay. all right. So take me back a little bit. 
Uh, when did you start the company? Why did you start it? Like, how, how, how did the whole thing begin? So I did personal training and nutrition coaching for many years. Uh, even before I moved here, uh, I was doing it in Connecticut. Yeah, you said you were, you were in a fitness at, at the young age of 12. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah, mom was a dietitian. She was actually at Yale for a while. And so she gave me the little bit of spark to pursue it, I guess. Um, so maybe, I think, 17, I got my first job, personal training. And that carried through. So I moved out here. I actually originally worked at, uh, I took a job at Sears Warehouse, miserable, making seven twenty five an hour um, until I started on my own uh, training people. Uh, I ended up working at a gym up in Scranton, Uno's. Did that for years, bounced around, did a lot of in-home stuff, et cetera. Um, and eventually I had one client, Mark, who, uh, good friend of mine. So I would train him, train him, train him. We'd spend tons of time in the gym. Uh, I'd give him you know, advice on what to eat and whatnot. And he wasn't able to lose weight. So that was his main thing. He was trying to lose weight. One day he saw me eating something I put together, probably, you know, chicken, broccoli, rice, whatever it was. The classic. Uh, yeah, the classic. Um, and he's like, hey, you should make that for me. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 well, I wasn't really into the idea at the time. He's like, oh, you know, you know, 30 a few bucks. You just make a little more than what you're used to. I said, sure. Um, and I started doing it and I made them pretty much uh, initially, you know, a few meals. And then I was making them like all his meals. Um, so you were like meal prepping. Yeah, I was literally him. his. I was I Personal. was actually going to his house and cooking everything. Wow. Um. Yeah. Uh, it's like personal personal chef status here. Literally, yes. Yeah. Um. So I did that, and then eventually a couple other people asked. So he was he started losing weight. He would kill it. Uh, like that was a missing piece. So then a few more people asked, and eventually I was like, hey, I have no idea what else to do. You know, I don't want to count reps for the rest of my life. Um, I don't want to work in a gym the rest of my life, but I don't really know what else I want to do. And anyways, that propelled me to think about starting the business and then eventually starting the business. Um, uh, the issue with Mark and with everyone else, like why this is a thing, right? So it's like, clearly it's a convenient, you know, we prepare food and deliver it to your house. Like that's convenient. Moreover, um, in terms of eating healthier, dieting, there's a few things. One, there's so much crap on the internet of like, do this, don't do that, eat this, don't eat that, that everyone's just very confused. Um, and I get it. Like, if I wasn't, if this wasn't my world, like, I wouldn't know what to do. I always relate it to investing. Like, I don't know, like, just tell me, you know, the best thing to invest in and I'll invest in it. Like, that should be how easy it is. But it's not. <laughs> yeah, right, you need right. context. That's with everything. So... Um, so people just don't know what to eat. They don't have time. I mean, that's a big one. Clearly, you know, it's hard to eat healthy if you're eating out all the time, not because there's not healthy places to eat. Um, maybe from more of a weight loss perspective, it's hard to know what's in what you're eating. Cause even if it's the healthy place, like restaurants solely want to make their food taste good. What tastes good? Oils, butters, sugar. All, all the bad stuff. Yeah. All the bad stuff. Um, so, uh, and then the other point is some people just don't know how to cook. So all these things <laughs> kind of combine and it's, I mean, it's real. Yeah. 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 Um, so the so, convenience thing I think is a big, oh yeah. So ultimately it is a convenient. So we initially started marketing to like a fitness, uh, crowd, uh, and we still do, but a lot of people use us like a majority of people just use us because they want healthy food ready to go to eat throughout the week. Uh, and it tastes pretty good. We have a big convenience market now and we are, so it's, I love it because I think we do a good job, especially if you look at our branding and stuff like we're not, we're not really f too focused and this could be observed as a bad thing, but we're not too focused on like, you know, people that are at the gym seven days a week. We're not too focused on, um, you know, people who are, uh, you know, working out too much or not working out at all. Like our branding isn't. Uh, you're kind of right down the middle. Yeah. Our branding isn't too scary for either party. Like you're not going to like somebody who doesn't go to the gym, for example, wouldn't look at it and be like, oh, my God, that's too intimidating. I can't eat that. Whereas somebody who's a gym rat wouldn't be like, wow, that looks like a prissy, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the yeah. company I'm thinking of, like a nutraceutical meal, whatever. 
um, Nutrisystem. Yeah, so you kind of you kind of appeal to both both kind of both ends of the spectrum in terms of the in, t- in terms of somebody's fitness level. Yes, um, and ultimately, like, what is our food? It's food that I eat. <laughs> That's like literally like what uh, and I I don't create all of the recipes because I'm not an amazing chef. Um, I could hold my own though, but the the chicken um, and rice specialty. Yeah, the, yeah, the Broccoli. chicken and the rice yeah. specialty. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's the OG meal. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, the, our, the chefs and me will go back and forth on things. So like I'm a stickler for quality, um, among other things. So like wild fish, I think farm raised fish is absolutely disgusting. Um, grass fed meats, I think are definitely a little better than traditional grain fed. Uh, and then, you know, non, I think the oil, uh, that is commonly used things like canola and soy oil are probably worse than we realize currently there's some data on this, but it's not completely clear. But you know, we only use olive oil, coconut, etc. Anyways, um, that yeah, it's and that's what I like about like Fit AF is in uh, a place where I can use to a degree my own creativity to be like, okay, you know, I like all these things, um, but you know, I also could eat like dirt and be fine with it like i <laughs> i don't in, in the sense that yeah. i don't need like an extravagant meal all the time so a lot right. of it is okay what are all the components of meals that i like and how can we make this uh more suitable for people who are not me who eat dirt um and yeah and that's what we do wow yeah so you got so you got three different like levels here, yes right how, how does it work So, okay. So if you were curious, basically, so everything's done online. Um, We deliver once weekly. We deliver on a Sunday. So deliver Um, right to the house. Yes. Right to your house. It comes in an insulated tote bag. Right here. um, Fit AF. ice and your meal. So you don't have to be home right away. Now that it's getting hotter out, though, you know, we have like, you say, grab your food within like an hour of us delivering it. Um, but basically you would order online. So basically go to the website. There's no, you can subscribe, but you don't have to. And it's not like the subscription box isn't already checked. So you don't have to think we're going to yeah, you're scam, you over. Scam, yeah, yeah. Sign up for, um, <laughs> can't, can't cancel just, it. Yeah. yeah. Just sending you food every yeah. week. <laughs> it's piling up, <laughs> yeah. it's piling up at the front door. <laughs> um, you basically go to our website, fitafnutrition.com and, uh, everything's somewhat clearly laid out. So, You'll answer two questions. One is, what size meal do you want? Um, we have three sizes, and it's something that not other companies do. Um, and I was, we were talking earlier about this, and like, I get why because it's a logistical nightmare to have three sizes of. Uh, I think we, like I was saying, one hundred and twenty-ish meals. I think that's it on an eight-week rotation. So every eight week, so every week the menu changes uh, because a lot of people use this week to week. They don't want to see the same things. Um, so we have plenty of options uh, and going back to the sizes, uh, there's lean signature and performance lean is the smaller signature, medium performance, large. Um, and it's basically by calorie count. So lean three to 400 calories, signature five to 600 performance, seven to 800. And within those are your variances of, uh, low carb or keto. We do paleo vegan, uh, not a whole lot of vegan. I get hate mail because of that. Uh, I do. And then <laughs> hate, hate mail. Yeah, gluten free, dairy free, all that stuff. And you don't even if you're not into that stuff. Like there's just there's a key on the page. So if you are you know following a ketogenic diet, there's just like a little you know there will be a K on the meal just so you know. Um, but you certainly don't. You know if none of that matters to you, just get whatever sounds good. It's all going to be within that calorie range. Um, so you answer what size you want and then how many meals you want. And I think we have a group like 4, 7, 10, 14, 21, but you could go above or below that to whichever degree you want. And then you check, uh, pick your meals. Um, and we have a pretty good variety of different proteins. I love like game. Um, no one, it's like the least, uh, one of the least ordered meals is, you know, we do wild boar. Uh, that's fairly popular. Bison's fairly popular, but whenever we do elk or venison, uh, not as popular. I'll take the elk. Yeah, I think it's great. I freaking love it. Yeah. Um, we have really it's a uh, an elk, uh, spicy elk hash. It's um with like a, a hash of sweet potato white potato. A- anyway, it's very good. Um, I'll bring you some soon. Yeah, definitely. I need to get. Some, I need to get some of that elk. Yeah. Um. It was so, and that's a good example of like 
how this is me and I'm not everybody. Like I actually wrote, I had a email newsletter the other day of like, we're starting to do bone broth. And I wanted to make sure like, I love bone broth, but I also like dirt. So do, do you, <laughs> yeah, like, do you like dirt too? Yeah. Do you, so we cool. You yeah, like dirt? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, you know, do you want, you know, would you like bone broth on the menu? Would you like bone broth soups? Um, and I posed that and I threw in the, I had a, I think we ran it once. It was a liver meatloaf uh, that like nobody ordered. This was years <laughs> ago, but uh, it wasn't all liver. It was like, it was, I don't know, 60% ground meat and then some liver. Uh, no one like no one wanted it. Huh? Yeah, no one wanted it. Um, so, so I wanted you were stuck to, eating it all. Yeah, which was fine with me. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to be another one of those with the bone broth. Uh, and we got good feedback. Uh, I guess bone broth is popular with people other than me. Yeah. Um, so 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 who makes all this food? So I help, um, and then I have a team. Our kitchen is maybe thirteen or fourteen people, um, and then all cooking. Another seven, yes. Um, there's a lot of food. Yeah. A lot going on. Uh, but I have uh, a couple I mean, I mean, all my staff is amazing. We have, we thoroughly enjoy each other's company and it really makes going into the weekend, which can be very stressful, um, a lot easier. And we, we started doing like, I mean, every year we'll do it. We'll do like team hikes and stuff like that. We're going to go to Rick. Uh, we just went to Rick. Gun. we're going to go to Dorney park soon. Anyways, great team. So, uh, my main cooks are Ed, Eddie, um, Ed, Ed and Eddie. Yes, Ed and Eddie, um, and then a few others: Alyssa, Lacey, and uh, Skyler. Uh, shout out to you guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, it's so everyone. It's, everyone's pitching in, yeah, cooking, uh, and we're basically cooking Friday, Saturday, and then delivering Sunday. So we're doing close to three thousand meals within two days, um, two very long days. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of meals. Uh, yeah. And more. So, I mean, yes, but it's also 32 different meals, which makes it a little more complex. But we're yeah. always getting better. As you it. said before, a logistical nightmare. Yeah. 32 meals in three different sizes, um, which makes things like forecasting ingredients and being prepared just a little hairier. But then I have Eric, who is not in the kitchen, but he's kind of my logistics guy um, who is phenomenal. We call him Yeti. He actually prefers to be called Yeti. Yeti? Um, yeah. Yeti. Okay. Yep. And you, if you saw him, you would know why. He's a big, very pale skin. He's a Yeti. Yeah, he's a Yeti. Yeah. <laughs> Likes it called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, he's phenomenal with things. Like, he's built, uh, I don't know anything about databases or, like, coding stuff. He codes and, like, just makes everything beautiful and all of our systems uh, work with one another. It's a beautiful thing, but yeah. thankfully, yeah. So, so when did you? How 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 long you have you been in business? Uh, five years this summer. So, what was it like when you first started versus now? Um. Oh God, it was terrible. Uh, <laughs> when you first was, started, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no. Uh, no. And now, it's, <laughs> well, it, there's three, all, three mean, thousand meals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. So when I first started, like I said, you're like anxious, like, oh, is it gonna work out? Like. You know, what do I do? I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, and then you slowly start to like grow your uh, sea legs uh, and you start that anxiety starts to go down. Um, and it was it's an exciting it was an exciting time. It still is like we're constantly innovating and expanding and looking at new things. And um, but it, I try to now I could remind myself more that it's exciting and not anxiety provoking because both kind of feel the same right and it's more so the story of like huh we're about to start you know delivering to new jersey like that's exciting but i feel this thing in the pit of my stomach uh and uh remembering again like i said that it's it is what it is and uh, as long as we do a good job of what we're doing then you know that's all we can do yeah so so like looking back to when you first started talking about the whole anxiety thing you know mm -hmm. starting the business right is it gonna work you know like what would, what would you what would you either have done differently or said to your younger self um i don't think anything i would have said wouldn't have done anything because when you're in that as much as people are like you know, it'll all work out or whatever the hell people say to make you <laughs> yeah, feel better. Yeah. Like you don't internalize it. Um, it's really just it, more so it's the experience. So you gain wisdom through experience and 
not to say I'm full of wisdom, but um, you do. So that's, I think business is great in many respects, like for people going into it, because you gain wisdom. You're forced to do things that are extremely uncomfortable, have extremely uncomfortable conversations, you know, put yourself in uh, positions you normally wouldn't and have to solve problems that you would never put yourself in the position of solving if you didn't have to. Um, and through those experiences comes things like wisdom, which then allows you to be in a more comfortable position to do those things again in the future. And then you're constantly growing. Now it's like, now your problems are even bigger. The more you grow, you have even worse conversations, uh, <laughs> yeah. more uncomfortable situations and you grow from those and then you're on to the next. Yeah. So did you say you were, you guys are expanding to New Jersey? <sighs> yeah. So we're looking at a couple different things, uh, a courier service uh, we might start working with in New Jersey who would basically handle our deliveries for us. We're also working on shipping as well, which is, uh, another logistical nightmare. Totally. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So many like variables and things that could go wrong. And yeah, we're very close though. Uh, the goal this year is f- to be fully in Philly, uh, in Jersey. Wow. And if cool. we ship, we'll have a 300 mile radius of shipping, which would be awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So exciting. Yeah. It is exciting. <laughs> yeah. So like, how, how did you grow the business? Like what, like what, <laughs> what are some things you did to, I mean, cause it, it seems like, it sounds like you've grown substantially in five years. Yeah. Um, initially it was, I would go to gyms and I would set up a table and I would hand out samples and talk to people. And that was it. That's all I did for maybe the first year or two. And that actually was like huge. Like it got me in, I mean, clearly it got me in front of people. It got me, uh, you know, people saw me, they saw the business, they started to recognize the name more. Um, that was huge. And now of course it's, you know, we do a lot of social media marketing. Um, we still do that. I still do that. We do events, we go to gyms, we, um, go to races, things like that, hand out samples, talk to people. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else that was, uh, that was real. I mean, just it was a lot of footwork. Yeah. Just doing a lot of that. And I'm Literally. like, yeah, kind of, I, I lean toward being more of an introvert. Um, yeah. So how, how did that work for you then? It was, yeah, it was, it's one of those things again, like when you're put in that situation, like I would never do that unless I had the business to force me to do that. I saw this as being like, this is a necessity, suck it up and go do it. Whereas if I didn't have the business, I would never do that. And then I would have never gained the, you know, the experience of having done that. Um, which is why, again, I think not, not that I think everyone should go into business, definitely not. But, um, if you're thinking about it, it's definitely a, a great course in personal development, yeah. uh, in that respect. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little, you, you know, personal <laughs> development, like what has it done for you? Yeah. Um, uh, let me illustrate one thing. Cause I think it, it actually seems to help people and it would kind of give people insight of maybe my way of looking at things. So kind of going back to, we'll talk about the brain. Uh, and I'll say this in a way that's not, I'm not a neuroscientist clearly. Um, but I am very fascinated by neurochemistry, uh, neuroanatomy and things like that. So I alluded to before the prefrontal cortex, um, which is, we could call it the adult of the brain. Um, and then we ha- also have something called the limbic system. That's where your amygdala is. Um, hypothalamus, I believe is also a part of it. The limbic system is the reptilian brain. So this is an older brain that uh, we share in common with things like reptiles. And the uh, limbic system is solely focused on uh, moving toward pleasure and away from pain. Now, you have one system that wants to feel good and doesn't want to feel bad. And then you have the other system that wants to plan things and wants to uh, help you achieve things. And, you know, again, kind of like the adult of the brain. And there's a good metaphor that, uh, Dan and Chip Heath, these are two psychologists that wrote a book called switch or drive. I forget which one it was, but they came up with this metaphor, this whole dance between the limbic system that wants to feel good. And, the you know, prefrontal cortex that, you know, wants you to achieve goals and stuff is likened to a rider, a physical person riding, on top of an elephant, elephant being the limbic system that wants to feel good, rider being the person. What that basically means is the elephant, if the elephant wants to go one way, the elephant weighs 10,000 pounds, it's gonna get what it wants, where the rider 
might want to go the other way, but if it's not strong enough or if it can't motivate the elephant to go with it, the elephant's going to win. So, okay, so that might be a little ambiguous. What does that actually look like? Well, if you've ever dieted, for example, and you're in a room full of cookies or whatever treat you like, what is that experience like? Well, you part of you is, you know, saying, no, I'm not going to, you know, eat any of these cookies. I'm dieting. Like, that would be stupid. Um, and then the limbic system is saying, yeah, but you don't know these people. You're kind of uncomfortable, and it would feel so good if you could just eat a couple of those cookies, and you have this dance between the two. This is a huge... So again, and I often illustrate this to people in weight loss because it's. I think it's a helpful way to view your own behaviors in a way of saying, huh, why am I... You know, I, fe- I know I should be doing this, but I keep doing this. Okay, well, now I at least have some sort of context of what's going on. It's not because I'm, you know, a terrible person. It's just these different components of the brain are, you know, speaking to me differently. When we look at what brings us pleasure, what is pleasure? Pleasure is chemicals. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing this up, I think, is to sprinkle onto um, things we discussed earlier and to even go into things of like, I know, why are people burnt out and why can't people, why do people struggle with weight loss to begin with? You know, is it, and to go there, people don't struggle with weight loss because they don't know what to do. That you might think that, but in reality, like, there's plenty of information on what to do. There's a quote I like, uh, it's, if information was uh, power, there would be more billionaires with six packs. That was Derek Sivers. I wrote a, uh, he made a business CD baby in the 90s. Anyways, fantastic quote because it kind of, explains this predicament of like people like you don't you know people trying to lose weight there's not a there's two components of weight loss there's the psych there's the strategy of what do i do and then there's the psychology and more people struggle with the psychology portion the strategy is easy you consume less energy than you expend um we could go into that if you want to but the psychology of is how do i get myself to consume less it's difficult when, you know, food is comfort. Yes, um, what's the secret here? Well, I'll get to it. <laughs> All right, Hold here on. we go. Okay. All um, right. I'm skipping ahead here. So strategies, you know, you see things like you know, all the diets, right? Keto. Uh, paleo, all these things, all of them are fine, but they're just not necessary uh, And you know, data has proved this over and over, but, uh, all of those things, all they do is help you get into a calorie deficit by in a ketogenic diet. You don't consume carbs by not consuming carbs. You can stumble into a calorie deficit, um, because you're emitting this entire food group. It's not that, you know, your insulin levels were low cause you're not consuming carbohydrate. And you know, if you're fasting, it's the same thing. It's not that because you didn't consume, you know, food between these window that you're going to be able to lose weight. It's simply that those constraints that you put on yourself got you to lose weight. And it's not a promise at all. Um, again, you might stumble and fall into it, which some people do. Uh, downside of that is you don't learn anything. And then when you want to eat quote unquote normal again, uh, you don't know what to do. You introduce carbs again, and then you gain the weight back because your portions are all out of whack. You're hungrier than you were because you just lost a bunch of weight. So you're more prone to storing fat and being hungrier. And then people gain weight back and they say, oh, I knew carbs were the devil and they feel badly about themselves. And then they're back at square one again. So um, the answer is, well, at least in weight loss. So my strategy for the people I work with and that I promote is generally tracking to some degree. So again, if weight loss is an equation, it is, and I'm, I actually just had this like view of like, wow, Jordan, you just jumped around a shitload. Are we okay? <laughs> I think we're all okay. right. I think so. Weight loss is an equation. It is energy in versus energy out, and that's literally it. And I, if I, I get that a lot of other things have been touted. You know, carbohydrates or fasting are required, or you know, lo- dropping carbohydrates um, are required to lose weight. It's just not true. Um, that was the carb insulin model for obesity, which has been. Uh, proven wrong over and over again. Anyways, uh, tracking. So if I know that I burn 3000 calories a day, then if I could consume 2,500 calories a day, I'm guaranteed to lose weight. That's a beautiful thing. Um, but it takes understanding those two variables. So what I expend, 
um, we, you know, is a very good guess. So we can use calculators and equations to determine that. And that's our starting point. And then, okay, if again, 3000 calories, cool. I'm going to stay below that. It works every time. There's no, you know, if you're tracking, if you're consuming, you know, certain amount of calories, certain macronutrients, you're going to find a macronutrient blend that works. You can't not be successful. Um, because at some point you're going to be in a calorie deficit. There's going to be a gap between the energy you're uh, consuming versus the energy you're expending. And that's going to work in your favor and your body is going to go into stored body fat to gain energy. Now that's useful, but that's not easy for people. You know, okay, I have to track everything. Well, you know, how do I do that? All this stuff. And that kind of goes in the psychology of things. So we have a nutrition coaching program. Um, actually, which I rarely talk about for whatever reason, I think, cause the meals just take full, uh, I mean that it started with the meals and we launched nutrition coaching a few years ago. I have multiple coaches that we work with people one-on-one -on -one. anyways, part of that, you go through this course and there's a bunch of videos with yours truly. Uh, and <laughs> a lot of the videos are explaining kind of what we're talking about now, kind of, um, the science behind nutrition, how it works, but then there is some. Uh, behavioral components too. One of the first things, like I said, is what is your why? And it goes in depth as to like, here's, you know, here's how to dig deep and really find it. And here's what you should be thinking about. And because the, the stronger you are on that, why the more you will be motivated to do the behaviors that will lead to your success. Cause that's a tough thing, right? It's again, the psychology component is, um, how do I get myself to do what I know will work? We know what works. 100% we know what works, but getting yourself to do it is the challenge and nobody focuses on that. Everyone just wants, everyone wants more information. They want, you know, we know what works, but what's, there's gotta be another tip. There's gotta be another five yeah, like step a, plan. Like a, like a secret. Yeah. What is it? And unfortunately there is none. And that's like, I think the quicker people realize that really with anything, you know, anytime someone tells you, here's the five plus plan five-step plan to doing something it's usually garbage there might be some truth to it but like there's no five-step plan to doing anything that's worthwhile it's understanding a bit of context and knowing what you actually want because once you know what you want you will be motivated to do whatever is necessary to do it i'm a firm believer that you get exactly what you want and nothing more and if you don't have it you just didn't want it enough and people might look at that and be like you know, I've gotten pushback from that, but it's very, very true in my eyes. Uh, you know, people might, you know, people want to lose weight, but they're not losing weight. Well, and then I would say, you know, you, you don't want it enough. And people say, well, that's, you know, bullshit. I, of course I want it. But it's often it. Yes, yeah, it's like a, this is like mind boggling right now. Yeah, it requires a little bit of understanding within yourself. You might want to lose weight, but slightly more than your desire to lose weight is your desire to eat certain things when you're feeling certain ways. So eat when you're stressed or whatever, um, or whatever it might be. Um, and it goes back to that pain versus pleasure thing. So if we take the analogy of the rider versus the elephant, kind of the secret to that is you have to motivate the elephant. The rider could pull on the reins all day because it knows it wants to lose weight. But if that elephant says, yeah, but I'm really kind of just unhappy and I just want to come home at the end of each day and eat this and I don't really want to go to the gym every day, then then that's just what's going to happen. Um, so, and there's no five-step plan to motivating the elephant. This is something, this is work one needs to do, which is basically, you know, just looking in toward what one really wants. Like, do you really want to lose weight? Oftentimes, no. The people, the idea of weight loss sounds good, but people don't really want it. And I'm not shaming anybody. Don't send me hate mail. Please. <laughs> Please no hate mail. Yeah. To me either. Yeah, or Bill. <laughs> Bill told me to say it. Yeah. <laughs> um but um no, and I say that with like in a loving way of like just dig a little like if you're struggling with weight loss yeah, really ask yourself, um, what, like, why? What do you want out of it? Yes. What are you doing that's getting in your way is a good question to ask um, because that's often the place to look. And truthfully, kind of what I alluded to before is, you know, if you're unhappy, like, if you're unhappy, it's a lot harder to lose weight. Uh, 
it's a lot it's a lot harder to do a lot of things when you're unhappy so sometimes figuring out where or why you feel stuck or not fulfilled is um the foundational thing uh that'll propel your weight loss and life forward meaning like sometimes it's stuff like you know i've I haven't talked to my boss, you know, I feel like he treats me like shit and I haven't gotten a raise, whatever it is. And like that stuff just, uh, gets into other areas of our life in a way, because we know we should do something about it and we don't, and it eats away at us and it makes us, you know, seek pleasure because we're constantly in this slight state of emotional pain. Um, in that state, it's hard to lose weight. So these are kind of all barriers that are just, yes. you're kind of putting up yourself. Yes. And, and again, this like I, I get it might sound a little woo woo or like I'm trying to play psychologist or anything, uh, but it's fundamentally, I think, very true with many things. So, oh God, I want to throw in some neurochemistry, but I feel like I've already thrown in a lot of give me, stuff. Give me a couple quick facts. All right. So if we explore this pain pleasure thing, what is that? Okay, so if we look at dopamine, dopamine is a very fascinating chemical because it's not the chemical everyone thinks it's you know something you get as a reward like oh I you know I did drugs and I got a hit of dopamine. I mean that's somewhat true. Uh, you get dopamine from anything, sex, uh, being praised, whatever. But dopamine is more so a motivating molecule. It motivates you to go do something, and then yes, you get a hit. In the brain, you have. Try to make this simple. It is simple, but it's going to sound complex at first, and then I'll tie it all together. In the brain, you have phasic and tonic dopamine levels, and I always get the two confused. Phasic is this um, baseline dopamine, and that very much dictates your level of contentment at any given time, how much phasic uh, dopamine is uh, circulating. Then we have tonic. So tonic dopamine are the hits. These are the chases. These are the, you know, hits of feeling good that we chase. And this is what I alluded to earlier is oftentimes we chase these things nonstop and we get these hits because we think that all these drops of pleasure are going to turn into an ocean of satisfaction, but it's never the case. And you realize that when you just look back in your life and you say, wow, I've spent the last 30 years chasing these drops of pleasure uh, and I've really gotten nowhere. So... Here's the thing with how these two uh, dopamine levels interplay. So every time you get that hit, you go above baseline. So you have your baseline level. You get a hit and you go above baseline. But then there's a subsequent decrease. So yes, you feel a little bit of joy. But oftentimes, then there's a hangover effect. Moreover, the more you get those hits, the more the entire baseline, the basic level of dopamine goes down. So this is the classic example of a drug addict. The more he pursues his drug, say, you know, meth, you know, he's getting huge. Meth is very active uh, or promoting dopamine. So you're getting huge hits of dopamine. Every time you do that, you're decreasing your baseline. So you're becoming less content, discontented, less happy. And then what happens? You chase those things even more because you're even more unhappy. So you're looking for those hits again, and it's this vicious cycle. And what happens with that is you get a narrowing of all the things that give you pleasure. This is the extreme case of the drug addict, but this happens in less extreme cases too. The more you chase something uh, and decrease your baseline level of dopamine, the the narrower your field of enjoyment is. Um, and that's big for a lot of people. So if we throw in weight loss, so a big thing I see is people – who drink a lot at night, maybe it just be a couple of beers, but they struggle to lose weight. Why is that? Is it because the beers have calories? Yeah, that's part of it. But more so, they're used to, um, they're seeking these hits. You know, beer is just a great way to get, you know, a release, a distraction. And how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if you can't sustain work without seeking pleasure because you're so used to seeking pleasure and getting that reward, you won't be able to do anything that's really all that difficult or worthy if you think about it, right? So dopamine makes effort feel good. Dopamine makes 
and and this is a, in a good way. So dopamine of like, so th- here's where like the flow state comes in. When you're in a flow state, there's a lot of dopamine going on. This is basic though. You're not getting a, just one little hit. You're getting this nice little rise. And that's why when you're in a flow state, everything is easy. Like task switching is easy. You're not, you know, uh, getting stuck on things. You're banging out a bunch of work because this feeling of effort feels easy. Same with exercise. How does somebody avoid that trap of, like you said, constantly um, with the dopamine going down your in your? Right. I, I don't know that, that that word that you used. Right. Like it's kind of your. It's you go on that roller coaster ride, right? Right. So how how does one kind of keep themselves like level? All right. I guess so is, the, is the best way. In I most, think and this is I know your rule, but this and I am not religious or spiritual or any of that. But in many uh, spiritual texts. There's a fundamental, there's a, there's a commonality. Uh, they say it best in Buddhism, and that is uh, desire is the root of unhappiness. Uh, and happiness is found in giving up desire. So they were, this was 2,600 years ago that Buddha came up with that, but that is very on point with this. So desire, my desire for something. So maybe it's, you know, I want to go into business to... Um, gain praise from other people to be accepted and they'll be like, wow, Jordan, good job. And you know, I'll feel really good about it. So that desire I'm chasing a peak. It's a long process, but I'm looking for that freaking high. Now in looking for that high though, I'm making myself, I'm basically saying I cannot be happy until I get that. There is literally a chemical profile that is a dip in dopamine when you do that. The more desires, and I, I, I'm going to move away from that word, the more insistences, insistencies you have that you get what you want or that life happens a certain way, the more you are making yourself prone to misery, right? If you apply that to most things in your life, anytime you've been unhappy, it's oftentimes because things didn't go your way, you didn't get what you want, or you lost something that you had. Um, so within those insistencies, and it, this is like, um, and, and then so, and so, wh- okay, so some people then will say, okay, I'm going to give up desires. You could do that. So if I give up desires, you know, I can give up my desire to, uh, I don't know, if, uh, uh, my attraction toward women, or I'm going to give up sex. Um, if I renounce it, then I just become a horny celibate. So if renouncing something is just giving it power as well. So you can't just forcefully say, okay, I'm not going to get pleasure from this anymore. Okay. I I get the rule now. I know how dopamine works. I'm just, you know, I'm smarter than that. No, your brain is always one step ahead of you. So, and that goes into, okay, because now you're desiring not to desire, which is ultimately a desire. This is a desire inception. Yes. And it is. And this is in people in Buddhism, like often get to this, precipice of like okay i gave up all my desires and you know they're seeking things like enlightenment and whatnot and they can't get there because they're still desiring not to desire um which is a selfish not that it's bad but is yourself saying i want this because this is going to make me happy once i get it so let me go back a little bit um now there again there's nothing anyone could tell you to do uh, to gain any more mental. So most people are, if we go to like, you know, happiness and things like that, most people, whatever they do, they're doing it because they think it's going to give them a state of mind that they think is what they want. And usually that's a state of mind that is, um, you know, that doesn't have a lot of mental pain and like worry and things like that. That's really what most people just want peace of mind. They might not realize it or say that, but any in in them doing what they're doing, um, they think they're gonna get it, or else they want to do it. The issue is nothing in the field of play can give you peace of mind, um, because you'll be chasing these dopamine peaks. Anything you do, because you're you're desiring peace of mind. So anything you do is to be, you know, getting these dopamine hits. So even if you get something, you're going to get it again. There's that little bit of, it's like a little drip, but those drips do not turn into a, 
ocean of satisfaction. Uh, and that's all I can even say. Like, you know, I could say, you know, we'll do some personal development stuff and, you know, then you'll figure it out. But that's me telling you what to do. And you're going to run with that and say, okay, if I do this, then I'll be happy. And that's you chasing the high again. So you can't chase the high. If anything, happiness is, if, if there was a happiness or a state that one wanted to attain, it's really found in giving up the need to have it. And you can't do that either. Because if you try to give it up, then you, you're saying you want it. Yeah. <clears throat> so my, fucked my, up. Mind blowing. Yeah, it's really fucked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, and I feel like half of the people listening right now are like, wow, this guy ate way too many mushrooms in his life. And the other half might be intrigued. Uh, and they're both right. <laughs> <laughs> they're both right. <laughs> they're both right. All right. Well, at least you admit it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, this was great, man. I, 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 I really enjoyed having you come on and... <laughs> Talk, talk to me about, you know, everything, you know, from your, your experiences and, you know, starting and running this business and all this stuff. I mean, this is, we went deep dive into some crazy things. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. It's all good. <laughs> I, I it's like, good. Yeah. It's like a different perspective. I've never really had anybody on the show that's really talked in, in these aspects before. So it's, yeah. it's a little new, fresh, fresh conversation. Yeah. I like having good conversation with people. I think a lot of times, you know, people talk and it's very like, uh, it's exterior talking. Whereas like I've, I like to get to the point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So back to, back to fit AF and the meals. Yes. How can someone, uh, get like buy the meals? How can someone learn about more about you guys online? All right. So if that, you know, having listened to this, if it didn't turn you away from us, <laughs> um, we, you can find us at fitafnutrition.com. So that is where you would order. Again, if you order before Friday at noon, we'll deliver it to your house um, Sunday. And we deliver all over Northeast Pennsylvania, work on our way south, Lehigh Valley, that area as well. Um, outside of that, Facebook, Fit AF Nutrition, um, Instagram, Fit AF Nutrition as well. Um, I'm on both of those. Uh, my email, in case you had any questions, I love chatting with people. Um, especially, you know, if you're struggling with something like weight loss or just wanted to chat in general, uh, Jordan at fit is my email. Very good. Don't, but don't send hate mail. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. If you guys hated the show, don't, don't yeah, email don't Jordan. Contact me. Yeah. Don't email Jordan. Don't email me. Yeah. <laughs> just go on your merry way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, man, this was cool. I, I appreciate you coming on and, uh, look forward to trying that elk. Yeah, totally. I'll yeah. get you some. Yeah, you know, hook me up with some of that. So, all right, man. <laughs> uh, Jordan Galasso on the Stacks Podcast in the Blue Door Studio. Thanks for joining me. <laughs>